Uh, I will give the floor now very quickly to my colleague Bart Kutis, Vice Dean uh, Research of our School of Catholic Theology, and he will uh, open this symposium in a more profound way than I can. Bart, please take the floor. I'm not so sure about that. Uh, Archibald allowed me to say three sentences. The first one is welcome uh, uh, to the colleagues from abroad, but welcome to all the visitors in this digital world. Uh, the COVID pandemic closed many doors, but it also learned us to open new doors. Uh, sentence three, one of the doors opened is this digital conference about one of the most fascinating stories in the Torah, in which the door for sacrifice of children was closed forever and the door opened for quite a few other interpretations as we will learn today. Thank you. Short enough, Archibald? Yes, I'm very satisfied. Thank you, thank you all, Bart, for this very uh, profound and uh, also very adept introduction uh, to this symposium. Very thankful that you will be here today in Ukraine. And first of all, I want to give the floor to our first speaker of today, my colleague Archibald van Wieringen. He's professor of the Old Testament, a direct colleague of Bart Kut at the Tilburg School of Catholic Theology. And he is specialized in uh, an Old Testament and in Isaiah and in all the other books. And he never stops to amaze me with his very uh, peculiar interpretations of difficult stories of which the Genesis is Genesis 22 is one of. So please argue about uh, start your lecture. I will start your presentation. OK, thank you so much. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for the kind words. Uh, yeah, I, I mailed my PowerPoint presentation to you, Bart, so you can share it with people. And yes, I see you are starting yes. sharing. Oh, Wonderful. Yes, and I think, uh, Bart, you see it too. Just to have a little check to see the PowerPoint now. Eh? Yes, very good. Yes. Bart, well, okay. go ahead. Thank you. So our pericope, Genesis 22, verses 1 to 19, in the Jewish tradition called Akedat Yitzchak, the binding of Isaac, and in the Christian tradition, mostly called the sacrifice of Abraham, has been studied in Old Testament exegesis from various perspectives. Presentation, it is simply impossible to discuss all these perspectives. That is the reason why I have chosen just one single angle. I would like to discuss with you the question, why this story is an exciting, thrilling story. I do not mean why is Genesis 22 a thrilling story as a psychological question about the real readers of the text, but rather as a narratological question about the text imminent reader of this narrative. In other words, I will focus on the communication taking place within the text itself which implies that we need a narratological definition of what thrilling means. While outside of the text, we have the communication between a real author and a real reader, inside the text, we have two levels of communication. The first is at the level of the characters who perform in the story. For our pericope, these characters are Elohim, God, Abraham, Isaac, and the two Ne'arim, the two boys, the two servants who remain silent in the text. However, characters do not perform on the textual states of their own accord. A textual director is responsible for the performance. This director is called the text imminent author, who by directing the characters communicates with the text imminent reader. For a narratological definition of thrilling, we have to incorporate these two communication levels, the first of the characters and the second of the text imminent author and text imminent reader. For this narratological definition, I make use of the study by Manfred Priester 
entitled the theory and analysis of drama original published in german uh, entitled das drama this is the narratological definition of thrilling i will use a narrative is an exciting thrilling narrative if there is this discrepancy in information between a character and a text imminent reader. I would like to go through the nine scenes of which our pericope consists of to demonstrate the discrepancies in information between the text imminent reader and the character. It's clear that discrepancies in information continue to exist even beyond the ending of the narrative. So let's start with the first scene. And it came to pass after this that God put Abraham to the test. He said to him, Abraham, and, and he said, here am I. And he said, take your son, your only one, your beloved one, Isaac, and go to the land of Moriah and make him to an ascending offering on one of the mountains, I will say to you. The first important point here is that the text imminent author explains the communication between the characters God and Abraham. God wishes to test Abraham. Abraham does not know that it is about a test, but the text imminent reader does. This implies that for the text imminent reader, not only is the question whether Abraham will offer Isaac is at issue, but also whether Abraham will pass the test. The second important point are the final words of verse two, that the character God speaks to the character Abraham. I share Omar Alecha that I will say to you. By saying this, God announces that he will have further contact with Abraham. The text imminent reader is curious about when God will speak to Abraham again and what exactly he will say then. So we will move on to the second scene. Then Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey and took two boys with him and his son Isaac split the wood of the ascending offering, stood up and went to the place that God had said to him. The last clause of verse three, I share Amar Loha Elohim, that God had said to him, is the most important one regarding the discrepancy in information between the text imminent reader and the characters. This clause says that God gave Abraham information about the exact place Abraham has to go to, as God announced in his direct speech to Abraham in the previous verse. The event itself of this new contact between God and Abraham, however, is not told in the narrative. It is an ellipsis. The text imminent reader now knows that these two characters were in touch but he does not know what exactly was said in this context. The third scene. On the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place far off. Abraham said to his boys, stay here with the donkey. Me and the boy want to go there to bow down and then return to you. Abraham took the wood for the ascending offering and laid it on his son Isaac and took in his hand the fire and a knife. And they both went together. So on the third day, Abraham sees the place where he has to go. He leaves the servants with the donkey at the foot of the mountain. However, the words he says in doing so raise questions for the text imminent reader. Abraham will come back with Isaac. That is not what the text imminent expects based on the test to sacrifice Isaac. Maybe Abraham does not want to upset his servants and neither Isaac. After direct speech to his servants, Abraham takes the things he needs for the sacrifice, the wood carried by Isaac and the fire and the knife carried by himself. 
and Abraham and Isaac go together without any trace of tension or fear. Let's move on to the fourth scene. Isaac said, Father Abraham, he said, my father. And he said, here I am, my son. And he said, okay, here are the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the ascending offering? Abraham said, God himself foresees the lamb for the ascending offering, my son. And they both went together. After the communication between the characters Abraham and his servants, we hear about the communication between the characters Isaac and Abraham. Isaac has a question for his father. Are we not missing something to make a sacrifice? To make clear what is missing, Isaac enumerates what is not missing, the fire and the wood. The text imminent reader notices that Isaac does not mention the knife. The knife seems to be absent in Isaac, uh, Isaac's perspective. The text imminent reader knows the answer to Isaac's question. He is the intended lamb for the sacrifice. However, that is not the answer Abraham gives. Abraham states that God will take care of the sacrificial lamb. For the text imminent to read that this answer can be interpreted into ways. Maybe Abraham says so in order not to frighten his son. Maybe Abraham knows more than the text imminent reader knows. After all, there was indeed an extra but untold communication between God and Abraham. In the end, Abraham will turn out to have spoken the truth. God will provide a sacrificial animal. And Abraham and Isaac continue to go on together without any trace of tension or fear. Let's read the fifth scene. Then they came to the place that God had said to him. Abraham built the altar there, arranged the wood, bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then Abraham put forth his hand and took the knife to slaughter his son. For the text imminent reader, this scene brings the tension to a climax. Isaac arrived at the place God told Abraham about in the elliptic direct speech. Abraham prepares everything for the sacrifice, even his son Isaac as the one who has to be sacrificed. Verse 10 forms the three. But the flattering is not there. Meanwhile, Isaac is calm. The text imminent reader hears nothing about him. After all, in Isaac's perspective, the knife is absent. What could happen to him? Probably nothing. Let's move on to the sixth scene. Then the messenger of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here I am. He said, you must not put forth your hand to the boy and do nothing to him. Yes, now I have come to know that you are God fearing and that you have not withheld from me your son, your only one. The messenger of the Lord interferes by calling Abraham and saying to him, to do nothing to Isaac. However, the content of his direct speech is not only about forbidding to harm Isaac, he also states that Abraham has passed the test. It has become clear that Abraham is really God-fearing because he did not withhold his only son Isaac from God. The text imminent reader already knows that it was about a test. But now he also knows that the test has been successfully administered. In this way, it appears to the text imminent reader that for passing the test, 
it is indeed necessary for Abraham to give away his only son on the, on, on the one hand. But it is prohibited to slaughter him on the other hand. After all, the verb shachat, to slaughter, was not present in God's direct speech in which he formulated the test to Abraham. We go on to the seventh scene. Then Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw for sure a ram behind with its horns tangled in a thicket. And Abraham went and took the ram and made it to a ascending offering instead of his son. Then Abraham called the name of that place, the Lord foresees. That is why it is said today, on the mountain of the Lord, it is foreseen. Verse 13 describes the activities of Abraham after the direct speech of the messenger of the Lord. The text imminent reader hears the same verbs as in the previous verses. Nasa et enayim, to lift up the eyes, ra'a, to see, halach, to go, and lachak, to take. However, this time, these activities are not related to Isaac, but to Orem that appears to be there. The so-called aufmerksamkeitserreke hine, for sure, marks this shift to the sacrificial animal. Now the activity of making an ascending offering is present in the text as an event. The moment the ram takes the place of the single and beloved son, Abram can be spoken of as making a sacrifice. Right after the offering, the place can be given a name. The place that was introduced in the text by an elliptic direct speech of God to Abram is no longer an anonymous place. Abraham calls the name of this place Adonai Kir'e, the Lord foresees. This is in line with what is said in verse 8 in answer to his son Isaac that God himself provides the lamb of the ascending offering. And by the way, in the Hebrew text, the verb ra'a means both to see and to, and to provide. And that is the reason why I use the English verb to foresee in my working translation uh, to uh, bring these two uh, meanings of the verb together. For the text eminent reader, the seventh scene is ambiguous. On the one hand, the aufmerksamkeitserreke hine, for sure, in verse 13, could imply that Abraham too is amazed that there is a sacrificial animal for the ascending offering. On the other hand, the character Abram seemed to know more than the text imminent reader, and now he appears to be right. In the second part of verse 14, Asher ye amir hayom behar Adonai yira'e, that is why it is said today on the mountain of the Lord it is foreseen, the text imminent author steps out of the narrative and discusses the consequences of the narrative for the present day. This Hayom today connects the text of the narrative to the day of reading by the text imminent reader. The text imminent reader, therefore, is hidden in the passive verbal form, Ye Amir, it is said. The text imminent author thus invites the text imminent reader to say the name of the place along with the character Abraham. In a way, he solves the discrepancy in information between the text imminent reader and the character Abraham. Let's move on to the eighth scene. Then the messenger of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven and said, by myself I have sworn because not from you, only one. Yes, therefore, I will surely bless you and make your seed numerous as the stars of heaven and as the sand that is on the shore of the sea. And may your seed inherit the gate of your enemies. And in your seed, all the nations of the earth will be blessed because you have listened to my voice. 
Once again, for a second time, the messenger of the Lord speaks to Abraham. For the text imminent reader, the effect of this is to emphasize the heavenly message. The climax of this second time becomes visible in three aspects. Firstly, the direct speech confirms twice that Abram has passed the test. At the beginning of the direct speech in verse 17 and at the end of the direct speech in verse 18. Secondly, the direct speech of the messenger of the Lord contains an embedded direct speech of the Lord himself, marked by the formula um Adonai, utterance of the Lord in verse 16. What is said, therefore, is certainly the Lord's opinion. Thirdly, not only is Abraham promised descendants, literally Zerah, seed in the Hebrew text, but verses 17 and 18 also describe the activities of the seed of Abraham. They will inherit the gates of their enemies, and they will be the instrument of blessing of all the nations. Due to these described activities, the seed of Abraham is present like a textual character, although it is not yet present on the textual stage on which the characters perform. However, if the text imminent reader can relate himself to this future character, the text imminent reader himself is the fulfillment of this climactic promise of the Lord. Let's go on to the last scene. Then Abraham returned to his boys, and they stood up and went together to Beersheba. And Abraham stayed in Beersheba. The last scene, too, triggers the text imminent reader. It is Abraham who returns, he alone. Where is Isaac? According to the text, on the mountain. After all, Isaac has been given away to God. The text imminent reader has heard this in the direct speeches of the messenger of the Lord a couple of times. Because Isaac has indeed been given away to God, but not sacrificed, Isaac cannot possibly return. This, however, implies that on the one hand, the words Abraham spoke to his servants in verse 5, that he and the boy, after bowing down on the mountain, would return, now appear to be not true. Although on the other hand, Abraham did speak the truth that he was not going to sacrifice his son Isaac. At the end of the narrative, therefore, it still remains unclear what exactly the discrepancy in information between the character Abraham and the text imminent reader involves. In other words, even in the ending of the story, the narrative remains partly thrilling and exciting. Very much for your attention. Thank you, Archibald, for your presentation. So I will, I will give the floor then to uh, my colleague and, and friend from uh, Lviv, Ukraine, Archibald and I, we went together uh, to your beautiful country and your city and you showed us much hospitality and enough humor as you already expressed to us. Uh, you are uh, Pavlo Smuchnyuk, if I say it correctly, but please correct me. You, he is the director of the Institute of Ecumenical Studies at the Ukraine Catholic University in Lviv, again in Ukraine. And the floor, floor is all yours. Yes, uh, thank you uh, very much for the presentation, Frank, and uh, uh, I'm also grateful to Archibald uh, uh, and you for uh, like the initiative of this conference, and I think that's important that uh, uh, we resist COVID in such a way and, and uh, cooperate together. So um, in my paper, I would like to draw on the Genesis uh, 22 story and the exegesis of the passage by a Jewish scholar, uh, Martin Buber, and a Russian Orthodox thinker, uh, Vladimir Solovyov, uh, in order to reflect on the question of discernment. discernment. Now, in a certain sense, the choice put before Abraham is a choice put before all of us. 
Not that it is asked of us to sacrifice our children or fatherhood or family for God, although some may feel that way, but in terms of discernment of the voice of God. In his fear and trembling, Zoran Kierkegaard says that Abraham's dilemma made him Kierkegaard sleepless. And one could wonder whether for Kierkegaard the problem was purely of a theoretical nature or whether it was directly linked to his personal situation. Almost certainly it was a personal question, but so it should be a personal question for us. Now, I have chosen Martin Buber to lead me in my reflection, not only because he is very helpful in thinking about the Akeda and the sermon, but also because he is connected to Lviv, uh, the city I, uh, where our faculty is based. Buber, who was born in Vienna, spent his youth in Lemberg, uh, in Austrian Lviv, uh, when his uh, grandfather, Solomon Buber, raised him. Uh, and I think that we should also study and promote him more. So on several occasions, Martin Buber responds to Kierkegaard's reflection on Akeda. Buber's point is that Kierkegaard took for granted that Abraham had the voice of God. Now this assumption, so the argument goes, should be tested. For Moloch imitates the voice of God. Buber in his essay on the suspension of the ethical gives the following summary of Kierkegaard's uh, argument. Kierkegaard sets forth the idea that there is a teleological suspension of the ethical, that the validity of a moral duty can be at times suspended in accordance with the purpose of something higher. When God commands one to murder his son, the immorality of the immoral is suspended. In the place of the universally valid stands, steps something which is founded exclusively in a personal relation between God and the single one, the Abraham. There are three aspects in relation to Abraham action which are worth emphasizing here. First is the immorality of the act. Second, the personality of the one who transcends ethics and third, the modality of this action. The first point is the act's intrinsic immorality. We call it sacrifice, but what we have in fact is a command to murder. The second point is that the suspension of the ethical is not a universal dispensation, but something that is entrusted to the single one, which, which means somebody who has a special relationship with God, which overshadows all other relationships. The third aspect is that the reason for the action, for the command, remains unknown. And thus, the action needs to be kept in secret, in isolation. In fact, Abraham does not explain what uh, he is doing uh, to Sarah nor to Isaac. I would suggest that three aspects reinforce each other. The silence is needed to allow, allow the relationship with God to remain the priority relationship, which transcends responsibility, yes, in very literal sense of the term, yes. Abraham does not need to respond to anybody about what he's going to do. As Jacques Derrida puts it, by keeping the secret, Abraham betrays ethics. Yeah? He doesn't care about the others. He and God is what matters. Martin Buber rightly criticizes this uh, Kierkegaardian dichotomy between the relationship with God and with other human beings. And I quote, that is sublim uh, sublimely to misunderstand God. Creation is not a hurdle on the road to God. It is the road itself. We are created along with another and directed to a life with one another. Creatures are placed in my way so that I, their fellow creature, by means of them and with them, find the way to God." End quote. But if you reject the very possibility of the dichotomy between God and others, or if you want, between theocracy and ethics, as Buber seems to advise, then how do we interpret the Akedah? 
Buber evades a direct answer to this question, but suggests some possible approach. Buber argues, and this is a key moment for my argument, that Kierkegaard takes for granted something that cannot be taken for granted. He does not take into consideration the fact that the problematics of the decision of faith is preceded by the question of hearing itself. Who is it whose voice one hears? Buber says that for Kierkegaard, it is self-evident because of the Christian tradition in which he grew up, that he who demands the sacrifice in, is none other than God. But for the Bible, at least for the Old Testament, it is not without further question self-evident, end quote. Buber cites the case of the census of Israel by David, by King David, while in the second book of Samuel, the instigation for the counting is ascribed to God. In the first chronicles, it is ascribed to Satan. Buber then makes more complex the choice with which Abraham is faced. The problem is not only whether or not to sacrifice his son, but whether or not the command comes from God. Therefore, knowing that Moloch imitates the voice of God, the primary question should be, are you really addressed by the absolute or one of his apes? The complexity of this discernment is pointed in a different way by Russian Orthodox uh, Vladimir Solovyov. He implies that in order to discern the will of God, one needs a bit of ethical formation. Solovyov suggests uh, that Abraham would have benefited from a better understanding, uh, which actually implies the discernment not exclusively as a matter of individual and God, but presence of the community. So the doesn't question the opportunity that Abraham should sacrifice something or renounce. Yes, uh, Solovyov says that uh, it's important to distinguish between the natural love and relationship on the one hand, and what he calls divine human life, So Solovyov, in a way, as Kierkegaard argues that in order to become the true ancestor of divine human life, Abraham needs to, and other people need to renounce in spirit their natural relations and attachments. In fact, Solovyov says that Abraham gives his son to God and receives Isaac back as the son of Abraham and of God, the prototype of Jesus. However, elsewhere, Solovyov underlines the complexity. He argues, I quote, Abraham, who had the greatest moral, moral receptivity, but an insufficient knowledge of what is contained in the idea of the good, decided to kill his son. He was fully conscious of the imperative of a higher will, but was lacking in the conception of what may and what may not be the object of God's will. A clear proof that even saints stand in need of moral philosophy." End quote. If Buber suggests the need for discernment with regard to whether the voice one hears is from God or of Moloch, Solyev insists that even if the voice is that of God, it should be properly understood and interpreted. I suggest that there is an important lesson to be learned from this. Discernment is a process that ought to happen on every level in the life of the church and individual Christian. And I would like in what follows to focus on a couple of issues. First, on the complexity of discernment in the modern world of fake news and post truth. Second, on the theological discernment of good, which transcends, as I will argue, the border between the religious and the secular world. According to Buber, although the Bible gives some suggestions regarding the sermon, for example, God speaks with a voice of a thin silence while Moloch speaks with a mighty roaring, in modernity, it appears to be extremely difficult to distinguish one from another. 
Our is an age in which the suspension of the ethical fills the world in a caricaturized form. The result is the confusion of the relative with the absolute, a life of illusion. The idea of the difficulty uh, of modernity is expressed by another Jewish thinker, Emmanuel Levinas, who also in his youth lived in Ukraine, in Kharkov, in Eastern Ukraine, Kharkiv. Today. In the modern world, no one is identical to himself. Nothing gets said, for no word has its own meaning. All speech is a magical whisper. No one listens to what you say. Everyone suspects behind your words and not said, a conditioning, an ideology, and, end quote. And this resonates with Buber's point about the, what he says, epidemic sickening of the world in our time, by which every world is at once covered with the leprosy of routine and changed into a slogan. And perhaps for contemporary popular populism, yeah, Ukraine is a country run by a comedian, huh? and religious fundamentalism, yes, with the politicization of religion and cultural wars, they serve appropriate illustration of what Buber and Levinas are speaking about. This leads us to the question of the post-truth. Yes, the mixture of truth and appearance mentioned, mentioned by the Buber and Levinas. Yes, they are probably the essence of what today we call uh, uh, post-truth. A recent document on a post-truth longing for the truth that makes us free, produced by a group of Ukrainian scholars under the leadership of Miroslav Marinovich, which is here among us, points out the extent to which post-truth in the modern world is linked to illusion. The problem is that today, fake news appears post-truths create illusion. The question, of course, is whether in this context of moral, modernity and illusion, there is any place for the sacrifice. I expected from Buber to lament the lack of sacrifice in the modern world. Yes, the world that we say is full of hedonism and degrees. But actually, he goes in a completely different direction. He says that in modernity, people are too easily prone to sacrifice. They give their integrity for some ideals be it freedom or equality. One could see in this a criticism of modern ideologies, of nationalism, perhaps the cult of progress. But we are also allowed to see here a question of the sacrifice, perhaps, to which the church has been encouraging to make uh, their members, its members. Is not the fight for the so-called traditional family values a new crusade in which we are called to fight or die. Deus wound? Question mark. This leads me to my final point, the discernment within the church and the secular. In the reflection on the effects of post-Constantinian situation of the church, Solovio asks, as Christians have renounced the spirit of Christ in their exclusive dogmatism, one-sided individualism and spiritualism, where has the spirit concealed itself, the spirit of God? Of character, religious tolerance, justice, as the work of the spirit, as God's action within the secular society. I quote, if Christians in name have betrayed the purpose of Christ, why can those who are not Christians in name and who renounced Christ in their words serve a purpose of Christ? In the gospel, we read of two sons. One said to the father, I will go and doesn't go. 
and the other said, I will not go and went. Which of the two did the will of his father? Asked Saul of York. I think that the implication of this is, is that obedience or rejection of the will of God doesn't coincide with the division between the church and the secular. On the one hand, theology should be willing to and capable of discerning God's action outside the institutional and sacramental borders of the church. As Jean Danielou suggests, it is through the modern signs of time that God challenges the church. So that the dialogue of the church and the modern world is at the end of the day, a dialogue of God with God. Since it is God who speaks to the church and it is God who speaks to the world. On the other hand, the memory of the sinfulness of the church, as the casta matrix, which appears when we think about the sexual scandals, etc., yes, should be in front of our eyes every time we engage in the discernment. Joseph Ratzinger, whose best day is uh, tomorrow, uh, has often commented on Ticonius, African theological writer of the fourth century who pointed out the fact that the church's body is bipartite, blessed and sinful, that of Christ and that of Antichrist, which coexists in history and can be separated only in the eschaton. To conclude, theology, particularly Eastern Christian theology, has often taken for granted that the church acts as the force for good and needs to resist the secular world. The Akeda, the way Buber and Solovyov reflect upon it, help us to challenge such an approach. Our icons, and Taras will be speaking of icons later on, after icons should not be black and white. The condemnation of the secular world should not be absolute, unable of discerning the good outside the church and the evil within. We should not forget that God can speak to and through the world while Moloch's sacrificial voice can be taken for the will of God in the church. For I desire mercy, not sacrifice. Hosea 6 and 6. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, uh, Pavel, for your inspirational talk about Genesis 22. And I would um, uh, so I have a pleasure now to introduce uh, Frank Bostman, who is a cultural theologian at the Tilburg School of Catholic Theology, specialized in religion and di digital games. And he will be uh, presenting on the unbinding of Isaac, religion criticism in the digital game, the binding of Isaac. Please, Frank. Yes, thank you, uh, Tara, so much. Uh, thank you all for being in our would be very welcome to introduce you in the wondrous world of the video games. But for this, I will share my screen again. And it would be very nice if someone would say, yay, we see YouTube here, then I know. Yes, we do. <laughs> very good. Well, The Binding of Isaac is a 2011 um, top-down dungeon crawler video game uh, made by... Uh, Edmund Macmillan, he's a very uh, famous uh, video game developer, also responsible for uh, Super Meat Boy and for The End is Nigh. In this case, he has made for us in 2011, The Binding of Isaac. What I'm going to do, uh, I'm going to show you the introduction of the game. I will show you some gameplay and I will give you the epilogue of the game. And after that, some of the endings of the game. And you will see that the game, The Binding of Isaac, uh, has an intertextual relationship with the biblical story of the same, by the same name, introduced to us by my colleague Archibald van Wieringen. But uh, uh, the text eminent author of this video game has a very typical, a very different view compared to the traditional ones concerning the story of The Binding of Isaac. So we will have a very dynamic intertextual relationship I will show it to you and then together we will work our way through it.
First of all, the introduction to the binding of Isaac. Isaac and his mother lived alone in a small house on a hill. Isaac kept to himself, drawing pictures and playing with his toys as his mom watched Christian broadcasts on the television. Life was simple, and they were both happy. That was until the day Isaac's mom heard a voice from above. Your son has become corrupted by... By sin, he needs to be saved. I will do my best to save him, my lord, Isaac's mother replied, rushing into Isaac's room, removing all that was evil from his life. Again, the voice called to her. Isaac's soul is still corrupt. He needs to be cut off from all that is evil in this world and confess his sins. I will follow your instructions, lord. I have faith in thee, Isaac's mother replied, as she locked Isaac in his room, away from the evils of the world. One last time, Isaac's mom heard the voice of God calling to her. You've done as I've asked, but I still question your devotion to me to prove your faith. I will ask one more thing of you. Yes, Lord, anything, Isaac's mother begged. To prove your love and devotion, I require a sacrifice. Your son, Isaac, will be this sacrifice. Go into his room and end his life as an offering to me to prove you love me above all else. Yes, Lord, she replied, grabbing a butcher's knife from the kitchen. Isaac, watching through a crack in his door, trembled in fear. Scrambling around his room to find a hiding place, he noticed a trap door to the basement hidden under his rug. Without hesitation, he flung open the hatch, just as his mother burst through his door and threw himself down into the unknown depths below. Yes, this is the introduction to the binding of Isaac. I will now show you a little bit of random gameplay uh, of the game. We see here little Isaac, and he cries all the time. And with the help of his tears, he can throw balls at enemies. That primarily consists of feces, blood, and tears. Okay, I don't, I don't like Dingle's little comrades here. I mean, no big deal, I guess. Okay, this is the worst part when he rushes at you. He has the runs! <laughs> oh, dear. That almost got me. There, there we go. Look at that. Whoa. I guess I gotta get Dingle's... Monstro's, Monstro's Tooth. Oh, I missed what it said. Monstro's Tooth. Well, as you can imagine, I could watch it for three hours at a time, but I'm not sure that you could, I could do that too. So let's... Uh, wrap this game up at the end of the game you will have to defeat this little isaac has to defeat the mother monster like a monstrous version of his own mother and when you succeed in overcoming the mother monster you will get the epilogue isaac was cornered his mother fueled with the desire to serve her god was bearing down on isaac as I'm told, my lord, I love you above all else, Isaac's mother repeated to herself. This was the end of the line for Isaac. His mother was far too strong for him. But just as he accepted his fate, God intervened, sending an angel down from above to stop his mother's hand. And just like that, it was over. That is the epilogue. So as you already have noticed, of course, is that we see here a not only a version of the story of the binding of Isaac in which the Testament author has to cope with all the blanks and the gaps in the original biblical text and has to, to, to give Abraham and gave uh, Isaac a body with eyes and a color and hair, whatever. But 
uh, the text eminent author did so much more. He recontextualizes this to a contemporary setting, not on a mountain uh, two or 3,000 years ago, but on, on the house, still on the hill, but nevertheless a house in contemporary, well, perhaps America of the, of the United Kingdom. Uh, we have a gender reversal. Uh, we not have a father, but we have a mother. The mother does not have a name in, uh, in uh, comparison. Abraham, Abraham did have a name. When in the original biblical text, uh, the, the, the architect, uh, it was the, the main character was Abraham. He was the hero of the story. He, his faith in God was so great that he would even sacrifice his only son. And that would prove how much Abraham loved God. Abraham is the hero of the biblical story. Here it is reversed. Isaac here is the, is the hero of the game story. And he is the one who has to overcome his murderous parent in order to survive. In the biblical text, the voice of God is just there. Well, in the game, the voice of God can only be heard by the mother, the mother who watches Christian broadcast television the whole day. And the game story clearly indicates that this woman is a little bit mad. So on the first glance, you would say that this video game gives a religion critical approach to the story of the Binding of Isaac, which has done by so many critics, critics and atheists alike the last decades. So from the top of our mind, we could say this is a religion critical interpretation of the Binding of Isaac, in which the text imminent author suggests that you have to be crazy to think that there is a God who wants you to sacrifice his only son, and that such a thing would be good, would be morally right to do so. So the game problematizes in the first the obedience of the father or the mother, which was exactly the thing in the biblical context that made Abraham the hero he was. But the game is more complex than meets the eye. We can see here that these are drawings in black and white, but there is like a, a, um, a desk at the back with a pencil and a little thumb. And sometimes a fly comes over the paper. And then at the end of the prologue, let's go to that, we see Isaac threw himself jumping down into, into the unknown depths in, below. The depth below. And then we see just not, not the black and white drawings, but now we see a pink Isaac. In his room, there's a door. There are some pictures behind him on the wall. He is holding a paper in his hand, presumably the one we just saw. And the same happens at the end, oh, I'm so sorry, at the end of the epilogue. So we see a triumphant Isaac, triumphing over the mother monster. Then we see again Isaac as he is, the, 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 the drawer of the drawings we just witnessed. But then the silhouette of the mother appears in the door with a sharp knife in her hand, presumably suggesting that Isaac did not escape his mother, but he only thought he escaped his mother. So now we get a second communication scheme. We get a second narrative layer in this game. That is that Isaac is confronted with a murderous parent, murderous, murderous mother, and he tries to psychologically cope with that fear, how is it possible that your mother from all people is the one who is trying to murder you? And then Isaac constructs a, 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 a narrative, a world, a framework in which it makes sense for him that his mother is the one trying to kill him, not because it is his fault in the first place, but because she believes that God asks this from her. And of course, he is called Isaac, so he will have knowledge of the Christian Bible. His mother watches Christian broadcast television. He will know the biblical story of his namesake of the Old Testament. So with all the knowledge of the biblical story he has, he recreates a narrative around himself in which it makes sense that his mother is the one who's trying to murder him. So from a straight-on religion-critical approach to the biblical story, we now go to a 
psychological coping mechanism. But there is even more. When you walk through the different endings, there are 11 endings in this game, or even more, but we won't go into that. And then we see just a moment. Yes, let, let's take this one. You have multiple unlockable characters in the game. He switches to all the unlockable characters you have in the game, like uh, Mary Magdalene, Eva, Judas, Samson, all characters from the Old and the New Testament, which are not without some problem, so to say. The devil. Now we see him in the chamber again, in the room again. And he locks himself into the chest. Now, the other ends give you a combined vision of what happened. One time you see Isaac drawing on his uh, on his desk and you hear you can hear two people a man and a woman scream to one another they fight with one another and then you see him turning very sad he looks into the mirror he sees his own image change into that of a devilish version of himself he's reading in the bible he's hiding in this chest you see his mother walking outside with a, a wanted poster to see if if someone has seen uh, her child and eventually she opens the uh, the chest and she finds her own son dead also in another ending you see uh, pictures pictures of the parents the father and the mother of isaac and a daughter a daughter who is never ever mentioned um, uh, anywhere in the whole game but then you see that the mother and father have a crower with one another in on the pictures. You see the mother with a knife high up to the father. You see the father leaving the house on the hill. And then you can understand the third narrative layer in this game, the third communication level in this game. That is, Isaac's parents were in a terrible fight with one another, probably a divorce probably a very violent and disturbing divorce in which the mother raises her, her arm against her husband and the husband the father of isaac leaves the house then you see that isaac tries to find a psychologically satisfying framework for himself to cope with the image of his two parents fighting and as many children of divorced parents do, he eternalizes the, the, the cause the, uh, of the separation of his father. He blames himself for the divorce of his parents. So he sees himself as the devil. He sees himself as the culprit. He sees himself as the one who did eventually causes the separation of his parents. And for this, he has to die. So on the first level, we, uh, we see a story of religion criticism. How can someone believe that it is morally okay to murder your child because a voice from above tells you to do so? Then on the second level, we have a psychological coping mechanism by which someone can try to come to terms with a murderous parent. And we have a third level in which we see that the, the in which we see the the emotional and psychological trauma that is caused for children by the violent divorce of their parents. Well, this is an example, one of the many examples, but one of the more interesting examples of a rendering of the biblical story of the binding of Isaac and modern and contemporary culture. We see here an in very complex, very complex intertextual relationship with the biblical story, which appears to be a destructive one in the first layer, which becomes more difficult, more complex, and mere deconstructive as we pass on to the next narrative level. 
and this is what I have wanted to share with you. Thank you all for your attention. I will stop. So but let Great. me give you the honor, Taras, to introduce introduce you and and uh, like you did with me. And sure. uh, Taras Timo is the Device Dean of International Relations of the Ukraine Catholic University, also in Lviv. He's a very famous theologian and specialized in early Christianity, patristics, and the theology of the icon. It is an honor for me to announce his lecture, Sacrificed But Not Killed. Go ahead. Thank you very much, Frank. The very famous part is overstated, but uh, everything else is, is correct. Um, okay, I, I, will take, uh, I will take a more positive approach, I would say, to this story after those quite dramatic presentations, uh, and correctly so, because the story is really disturbing, and even in the text of the story, we can see this um, dramatizing feature, especially expressed in the question of uh, Isaac being as a matter of fact, he this detail, which is actually a very essential detail, is uh, central to the story. At least this is central to the reading of the story in early Christian, in Jewish, in early Christian, and in the Byzantine patristic tradition. And in my presentation, I will try to look at this story precisely through the lens of those traditions. Um, at the beginning, few words of apology is our due for the patristic approach to the interpretation of the Holy Scripture, because this is not what we are used to. Sometimes um, the link between the primary event or the primary story that is being uh, interpretation for the believing community is not obvious for us. And sometimes it can be perceived by us as artificial and stretched. Um, we have to understand, and I'm sure you do, that patristic exegesis is not built on the foundation of uh, historical critical method to which we are used. And fathers, the church, Christian interpreters and rabbinic interpreters do not ask themselves the primary question of what actually happened historically in the text, of what was in the mind of the author that wrote that, that this text, but uh, their concern was more with the interplay between the text and the community for which they interpreted this text. Um, this approach is uh, quite evident even in the New Testament references to this text, to the Genesis text, and the first uh, explicit reference to the Akedah uh, in the New Testament is uh, in the 11th chapters, chapter of the letter to the Hebrews, verse 19 saying, Abraham considered that God was able to raise men even from the dead. Hence, figuratively speaking, he did receive Isaac, his son, back. This quote is central for my presentation for two reasons. First of all, it alludes uh, to the idea that despite Abraham's fears, his son did not die. He was as if risen from the dead, which for uh, the author of the Hebrews has obviously Christological connotation as certain prophetic image of the resurrection of Christ. So again, sacrificed, but not killed. Second, why this quote presentation is because of the use of this mysterious phrase, en paravoli, or en parabole. Uh, in another pronunciation, uh, translated here as figuratively speaking, but there are there is a number of ways you can translate this phrase into English. It's it's a pretty unconventional way of expressing this idea that the story has 
typological or symbolical significance and is not to be read and understood at face value, but has to be penetrated under the surface of it, its literary meaning and understood in some kind of prophetic sense. Um, as I said before, the approach of this kind of interpretation is not historical critical, but symbolic and deeply relational. It establishes the relationship. It's, it's not interested in the text in itself. It's not asking the question whether Abraham, being a Mesopotamian uh, Chaldean man of his time, could possibly have an idea of the resurrection of the dead. From the point of view of biblical history and biblical theology, this is not possible because we are told by biblical scholars that the idea of the resurrection is very late and it might have a Hellenistic origin and so on. So uh, the author of the letter to the Hebrews referring um, to, to the notion of resurrection in, uh, in reference to Abraham, Uh, seems to be speaking complete nonsense from point of modern biblical theology. Uh, but what he is interested in is not in the mind of Abraham. He is not interested in the story in itself, in its proper historical context, but he is interested in the symbolic meaning of the story for his believing community. And as you know, the, the word symbolic comes from symbolo, bringing together, coming together. Quite similar this uh, key word of this passage, paraboli. Uh, it, it can be rendered differently, but again, etymologically, it means to put something next to something else, to compare something or to correspond, correlate between two things. So again, the idea in this story is um, to correlate the experience of Abraham and Isaac to the experience of believing Jew or believing early Christians and to their sacramental and liturgical lives. So I will be looking at various aspects of this story, specifically how Jews and much more in much more detail early Christians understood this and liturgical story. The two key concepts of the Akedah that tie them, tie the story to the community are faith and sacrifice. Faith need, does not need more explanation because Abraham is referred to traditionally in Jewish and in Christian, and I think even in Muslim traditions as the father of all who believed or the father of the faithful. Uh, the sacrifice is the climax point of his faithfulness when he actually decides to sacrifice his son, who is the, the essence of his life, the essence of all promises of God, to sacrifice him to God. But this sacrifice, although as if summoned by God, is turned away, is rejected by God, and is vicariously, as we might say, uh, substituted with the animal sacrifice. Um, this story is, is traditionally viewed as a positive story, not as the story of malicious God who is demanding blood sacrifice uh, of children. As a matter of fact, this uh, cult um, of sacrificing the children or human beings in general is harshly rebuked and rejected throughout the Old Testament. Uh, but this story is viewed as a positive example of turning, turning point away from the practice of human sacrifice, um, exclusion of human sacrifice from uh, the proto-Israelite religion. Uh, if we look at the Abraham story, it has three highlight points, the call, the promise of the son, and the in which Abraham is kind of manifest in his hierarchy of values by placing God over his own interest 
and even over the life of his own son. So this, that would be like traditional reading of that story. Uh, here I illustrate the sixth century mosaica from Ravenna, from Italy, which actually combines the two. It doesn't have the call of Abraham, but it has the visitation of Abraham by the three men and the Sarah to whom the promise of, of the son was made. And then this happy part of the story is kind of counterbalanced by the dramatic, tragic story of the sacrifice of Abraham, in which he is prepared to slay his only son, but the hand from heaven that represents this voice of God or the angel of God is stopping him and replacing the prepared sacrifice of his son with uh, the sacrificial ram or lamb. Um, the story, the Abraham figure is contested by several religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, and same with the Akedah story. Um, we know that Jews and Samaritans had dispute over whose is the and that dispute was expressed in the um, in the uh, controversy over the place, the location of the Akedah, because in the Jewish tradition, the, the mountain mentioned in the uh, Genesis story, the mountain of Moria, uh, was identified with Zion, the mountain in Jerusalem on which the temple of God was built. And in the Samaritan story, alternatively, this uh, mountain was identified as their holy mountain, the Gerizim. Um, also, this uh, fresco we are seeing here from the synagogue of Dura was made in the mid second uh, mid third century. Um, it's uh, the earliest representation of Akedah, um, one of the earliest in visual art, and certainly the the rare representation in the Jewish art, and it was made uh, in the holiest place in the synagogue in a niche in the wall in which Torah is placed. So this uh, central place in the synagogue was decorated with, with this uh, story of, uh, as you can see, it's rather roughly made from artistic point of view, uh, Abraham holding his son as, as if he was a baby, although we know from the story that he was an older boy. Uh, grown up boy, and uh, scholars suggest that the placing of this Akedah uh, visual representation in this central place in the synagogue points to certain controversy between Christians and Jews uh, in this location. In Dura Europos, there was a Jewish community with the synagogue and a Christian community, um, of, uh, which also left us some remnants of the baptisterium and, uh, and the church. And due to the closeness of two communities, uh, this contested story was represented by the Jews to emphasize that it is their own story, not the Christian one. Um, so back to my point that Isaac is sacrificed, but not killed. It's important, I think it's actually the central, uh, central idea to the story because um, the whole story is speaking about the liberation it's the liberation of Isaac, it's unbinding of Isaac, as Frank just spoke uh, on the material of this computer game. But in the biblical story, the un unbinding of Isaac is exactly, precisely the message of the whole story. And the story was read as such, not only by early Christian commentators, but also by Jews themselves. And hence, the Exodus, Passover, and then in the early 
Christian tradition with the Easter, with the resurrection of Jesus. And the connection is built on the fact that uh, this um, story of the sacrifice of Abraham is actually the uh, manifestation of his ultimate faithfulness towards God and fulfillment of all the promises that God gave him. And then uh, the happy ending of the story that Isaac is not actually slain, but substituted with the ram, points to the fact that he was eventually unbound from his feathers. He was actually freed and his life was preserved and the community of Jews um, celebrated this freedom of uh, freeing up of Isaac in the same line as it was celebrating the freedom, the liberation of people from the captivity, uh, from the slavery in Egypt and uh, possession of the Holy Land. And then Christians obviously added on the top of that their own reading, their own association of this liberation uh, with the story of the death and resurrection of Jesus at which we will look just in a minute. Uh, also, we have to make a correction that uh, sometimes in the tradition, the story is called the, the uh, sacrifice of Abraham and sometimes uh, sacrifice of Isaac. Uh, and uh, we have to be explicit that the absolute majority of the traditional sources, if we speak of the fathers of the church of early period, uh, make the emphasis that it is the sacrifice of Abraham again, because Isaac was not sacrificed, he was not slain, but it does not diminish the dignity of the sacrifice of Abraham because he actually made this final step into the abyss, so to speak. He actually agreed to the fact that he can sacrifice his son for God, and he made his ultimate sacrifice, which uh, was appreciated and recognized by God and returned uh, as the ultimate blessing on Abraham. Uh, the, uh, this line of thinking about sacrifice is picked up in a number of New Testament texts, probably most significant of which is John 3.16. God has loved the world so much as to sacrifice his son uh, for the sake of human Kind. Uh, so the story of the sacrifice of Abraham is clearly on the background of this Johannine saying. Then uh, a number, I will not tire you with numerous patristic quotations that would take just way too long time, but just will refer to few familiar names like Irenaeus and some other early church fathers who draw explicit connection between the story of the sacrifice of Abraham and um, read it as a prophetic prefiguration, prophetic symbol, Old Testament symbol of the sacrifice of the divine son of God in the New Testament. Uh, I will not reread the quotes, they are here on, on the screen, you can see them for yourself. Um, again, and the emphasis in all those early patristic com commentaries is on the sacrifice of Abraham, his moral sacrifice, so to speak, not the physical death of Isaac. Uh, other church fathers, uh, such as Ephraim the Syrian and Gregory the Nazianzen, refer to the sacrifice of Abraham as the great symbol or the prototype of the great sacrifice, obviously meaning by the great sacrifice the uh, death and resurrection of Jesus. Why death and resurrection? Uh, we will see again in a minute on the following slides. It's not only death and not only resurrection, but the two are brought together in this um, Genesis story. So the sacrifice and passion of Jesus is seen in this story, not in the death of Isaac, which did not happen, 
but it's seen in the various circumstances of the story as they are described. Um, the patristic exegesis is often built on small features of the text that might seem insignificant to us, but they served as markers for tracing certain theological ideas throughout the Bible. The same technique was used by the rabbis in their Midrash tradition. Sometimes they would pick up one word and, and spin off from that word many uh, unexpected theological ideas. In this, in this text, it's the word taxi translated and, and understood as firewood. Uh, needed for making fire and uh, for the sacrifice, but it's in the at least in the Septuagint tradition of the Bible, the the xilon uh, is often read as the again prophetic symbol of the cross in the Old Testament, and uh, in the later Christian Greek speaking Christian tradition. Taras, at uh, the I have to. Uh, I, I'm so sorry, but I have to remind you that we only have. Five minutes before we have to give the floor to your colleague Yuri. Yeah, I'm I'm, I'm finishing. I'm finishing. Um, so uh, there is explicit uh, explicit link with the passion of Jesus, signaled as if in some keywords in this uh, in this story. Uh, also, um, on which Abraham seen uh, the. Uh, mount to which he was uh, heading, and uh, the figure of the lamb or the ram uh, of God that will be killed. So the killing of the ram is actually the Old Testament uh, prefiguration uh, or prophetic symbol of the death of Jesus, not the killing of Isaac. Um, also, this uh, story is seen in the early church as a kind of dogmatic sacrifice. In ancient liturgies, the three sacrifices are mentioned, that of Abel, of Abraham, and of Melchizedek. And this is reported by Ambrose, but it can be seen in various ancient anaphoras. Um, Okay, I will just skip it. And the Isaac in the story is not the type of Jesus, is the type of Jesus' resurrection. The unbinding or losing of Isaac from his bonds and saving him from death serves for the church fathers as a type of Jesus being eventually free from death or in later Patrice the interpretations, the ram is identified with the human nature of Christ that suffered and died on the cross, and Isaac is identified with his divinity that could not suffer because of its divine nature and remained alive and remained the source of the resurrection of Jesus' humanity after his death. So just to summarize, uh, the traditional patristic and liturgical reading of the story of Abraham is uh, extremely optimistic. It's uh, the reading that emphasizes the rejection on the part of God of human sacrifice. Um, it emphasizes the trial, the probation of Abraham, but not the wish on the part of God that any human being should become victim to his grandeur, his majesty. And uh, resurrection, uh, the story of Abraham, Abraham's sacrifice is always read predominantly in the light of the resurrection of Christ and not just of passion. Thank you. Okay, uh, I would uh, like to invite the Dean of our theology faculty, Father Yuri Shuko, um, who is himself a biblical scholar, 
to say a few words um, in conclusion of this seminar. Father Yuri? Yeah, I'm here in Taras. Thank yes. you very much. On behalf of all participants, uh, let me uh, thank uh, the gratitude for all organizers of that beautiful conference for that beautiful presentations. Uh, to sum up, I would like uh, I would like to say a couple of words that what I am looking at the Bible. I am always taking on account that in most cases in the Old Testament, where Israel was tested, the context shows the testing stemmed from concern over the nation's obedience to God's command, laws, or ways. We may conclude that God wanted to test Abraham to know his heart and to see if he was so dear. The test is a term in which man that tries God, the meaning is altogether different. Such a test flows from the, an attitude of doubt and a sinful heart on man's part. In this situation, man wants to determine whether God's power will be adequate, the effect of which is to tempt God. But when used of God, there is no connotation of doubt or a desire to trick or deceive the one placed under the test. His testing was only concerned with obedience or with the fear of God, that is to say, and press the same spirit of obedience to God. God brings his creatures into circumstances of special testing, not for the purpose of supplying information for himself, but in order to manifest to individuals and others the disposition of their hearts. The relationship of father and son that existed between Abraham and Isaac was exactly the same the, uh, relationship that existed between God and Abraham. Abraham's test was indeed a qualifying test that had as much evidential value for Abraham. The point is that the test was not a temptation to do evil or a test that was meant to trap the helpless uh, patriarch. Instead, it had an opposite purpose. God intended to stretch Abraham and to build him up, as in his, the numerous tests in the desert. As used here, the ideas of tempting, testing, or trying are religious concepts. And sometimes people who, uh, for example, uh, um, are creating such games as was presented today, uh, do not take on account this uh, issue. And it is God testing the partner of the covenant to see if he is keeping his side of the agreement. God never tests the heathen. He tests his own people exclusively. Thus, the test is ever a test of God's own in order to know whether they will love, fear, obey, worship, and serve him. Thank you very much again uh, for your beautiful presentation and participation. Thank you. Yes, thank you uh, all. Thank you, Taras. Thank you, uh, Pavel. Thank you, Archibald, Patkut, Yuri. Thank Monsieur De Korte for his attendance. Thank all participants for attendance as I said i will remain here in this room until the very last because someone has to do it and i wish you all a very uh, blessed week and a very good weekend see you all next time thanks bye thank you very much thank you